one of my most recent live streams, we composed an in-game battle track for a potential upcoming video game. And in this video, I wanted to give you a little bit of an insight on what sample libraries and plugins we used, how we approached the mixing and the mastering, and most important, how we prepared this track to be loopable. Let's go. So let me play you the full track first. And before we start that track, let me activate the loop function here and see what's happening. So if you would have closed your eyes while listening to the track, you probably would have some problems by, um, you know, knowing where the track starts, where it ends. I mean, of course, the track starts, obviously, as you can see right here in the very beginning. But um, you could also see this final part here as some sort of the intro. Let me just play this back from here. <music> Actually, the beginning of the track could be already part of the, the main theme, what is following after this little intro here. So I'm kind of tricking with your brain or tricking the player's brain so that it can't really distinct where the track starts and where it ends. And this is very important when it comes to video game music, simply because... Um, if you compare that to film music, a film most likely always will be the same. You can watch a movie for a hundred times, always the same will happening. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? If it comes to game music, it's totally different because the player decides when he, for example, uh, enters a cave or how long that battle with an end boss will happen or will take, when it will end, um, how intense it will be. So just assuming this player is experienced and he goes into that cave and he's just slaying that end boss within like, you know, four minutes, you basically hear this loop, which is roughly around one minute long, four times. And during that time, you want to make sure that the, this, that this track doesn't sound, um, you know, repetitive, that it sounds boring. There will always needs to be happening something, but without getting the intensity or the dynamics that low that you could think that there is some for example regeneration phase happening that you just you know have a a potion or the the end boss is you know set to some kind of hibernation or sleep mode or whatever you need constant action and um, but also having a little bit of dynamics so the track sounds um, not boring, which is basically the most uh, the most important thing. Because imagine the player is not that skilled and needs maybe like ten or twelve minutes to slay the boss. You will hear that loop twelve times. However, it is a budget question and also an organization question of how many tracks you need. For example, there may be ten, twenty, or thirty dungeons, and you need battle tracks for the for the end bosses for each of these dungeons then this means you would have to write 30 minutes of music and 30 minutes of music is roughly uh, you always or we as video game composers we always roughly round about uh, that you are able to achieve or to compose one minute per day uh, of course 
you can create two or three minutes during a day, which is not really a problem, but the calculation goes like this, that there are um, edits on existing tracks or you really have to tweak tracks in between or finalize some things. Um, then there may be some rewrites happening. Um, maybe some tracks get rejected. So roughly to give you a little bit of an idea, I would always calculate to write one minute per day. So this means when you have 30 minutes of music, you roughly re need around a full month to do so. Okay, so let's check out the individual instruments here. Um, for the strings, I loaded the spiccato strings of Nucleus, uh, Audio Imperia Nucleus. We can have a solo listen to this section here. <clears throat> So you get the idea. I don't want to play the full track again for each instrument, but um, just to give you a little bit of an idea for the sound. So you may have heard this very low uh, brass part at the very end, or depending if you want to see this at the end of the track, but from the arrangement, these are the Junk XL brass um, chimbasi, or chimbasos, or however you want to pronounce it. So let me play this solo for a second. So these are very low. Let me quickly pull these up here. And um, as you can see, I probably explained this, or not probably, I explained this a few times during my live streams and videos. What I'm doing here basically is that I layered the staccatissimo, the Mercado shorts and the sustains. So therefore I'm pretty free to write. <laughs> I can work with dynamics. I can have harsh attacks. Or I can have subtle... Subtle dynamic changes, stuff like this. So the next thing on our list are um, the Junk XL brass trombones. And we just pull this up here. I did basically the same. Also the Staccatissimo Mercado shorts and the sustains loaded. And they sound like this. And you get the idea here of that little part over here at the middle somewhere. So you can see that I you know, kind of duck down or, or taken out the, the mod wheel. Um, so I can just have the staccatissimo samples being active. Because if I would move the mod wheel up, it would introduce the sustain and the mercado samples also. So I get kind of a, yes, mercato ish sound, but with a little bit of that staccato, staccatissimo attack at the very beginning. And if I trigger this softly, if I hit softer, the key, you just hear the Mercado sample. If I hit it hard again, you hear the difference between these two. If I just move the mod wheel down again, I can just play the staccato sample. So this is what happens here, that I have taken out the, or reduced, basically put to zero, the CC1 command, the my mod wheel here, and then I can design a phrase like this. Okay, so next instrument in our arrangement here is uh, again from Junk XL Brass, the French horn, the 12 French horns, and they sound like this. So you can see that I reduced the mod wheel again, turned it down. It's basically accompanying the strings. And now you get this little mixture of the um, 
you know, of all these articulations. I did the same here, staccatissimo samples, marcato samples, sustain samples again. So you can layer these again. And every time I have taken out the, the CC1 command here, it basically means that I'm just um, triggering the staccato notes. That's it for the horns. And then we have some trumpets going on, basically doing the same as the horns, but I think just an, an octave above and the same melody. They're just simply doubling. Um, we don't want any artistry going on here. We just have this battle track and it just has to put out, you know, provide energy and support the player being in battle. So let me just play this. Let me play the full thing here. Okay, so it may appear that some things are not really perfect um, uh, when it comes to the timing and everything, but I like to introduce all kinds of little mistakes so it sounds a little bit more human-like when you listen to the full, let's, let's listen to the full brass here. <laughs> Okay, so to me it's important how the general mix sounds and not how each of these individual instruments are sounding because this is not what you hear at the end, right? So next up would be the woodwinds and I just used a few staccato notes to put some emphasis on the high strings. So let me play these for you. Okay, that's it basically and i used the um the full ensemble staccatissimo notes actually it's not staccato but staccatissimo i'm sorry so the next thing is that so far i routed all of these instruments directly to the master bus i just wanted to uh, show you that now that i take these strings the brass and the woodwinds here by selecting by shift selecting these channels and hit shift and alt and route them directly to the um, orchestral stems here. And so far I also didn't have any reverb applied. So you can see that I used the RC48 earlier, but for this um, track, I just wanted to have all these orchestral instruments going directly into the orchestral stem, uh, into the orchestral bus, and there is just one instance of Seventh Heaven in there. So in general, I don't like to overthink all that, you know, reverb and uh, hall, orchestral hall settings. And I also don't like to match libraries because I tend to use all the valuable room information, room depth, or basically everything each of these sample library developers um, produced. So putting them all together should create more room depth, right? And um, I mean, I don't care for realism here. If I would do, you know, raw or pure orchestral classical music, then this would be another topic. But for now, I'm looking forward to have some epic battle track uh, as a background track in a game. And it should just serve the purpose to create, you know, intensity, dynamic and excitement for the player. So I routed now all of these into the orchestral hall. So let me play you back the orchestra only. And bypass the reverb. So it adds just a nice little tail and I think for the, you know, that setting of being in an, a role-playing game or some kind of adventure game, it's kind of suitable to have like a longer, like a reverb tail going on. 
instead of just making it like you know like the tail a little bit shorter or more more modern so i just wanted to have that little reverb to kind of like lord of the ringish where a lot of reverb is going on Okay, percussion time. So we have uh, timpani's hits and rolls here, and I used Symphobia 4 or Pandora for um, these timpani's here. And the reason why I love this library so much is that you can just set an amount of beats, for example, eight beats here, which is basically two bars. And then you can simply insert a timpani roll like this. And you don't need to pay any attention on, you know, where the sample starts, where the highest intensity is on that, on that roll. You just set it to like eight beats and then just put it in there and it works. So you save a lot of time, of course, by, by working with that library. It's definitely worth it. And um, the same goes for the cymbal ensembles. So I again used um, the hits and rolls of Pandora. Let me play use. Just these cymbal hits right in the beginning. And they also play an important role when you create these. Let me just solo the timpanis and the cymbals to create that loop because I am building, you know, towards the end, having that little cymbal and um, timpanis roll going on, which leads to the one of the beginning of the track again. So this of course helps to create that loop and making it more um, seamless. So let me play you the full track from here. Actually, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention um, these, this, this little run here by the woodwinds. Totally sorry. So there are flute runs going on and I used a Berlin woodwinds by this. And these are basically the runs transitions. And I just try to play a little bit of a run here. So you don't need to care about finding any appropriate phrase or anything. You just program a little bit of a... Let me just open this for a second. Like a little run here. And I just doubled that with the um, piccolo flute, which is the same program runs transitions, but just the piccolo flute. And let me play this solo to you. And now both together. Okay, so in, in combination with that stopped symbol here, Actually, I use two to make it a little bit bigger. So we create this little kind of, you know, like a surprise or something, which doesn't really distract from, from the track itself. Okay, you get the idea. So the next thing I used here is another Tum Tum hit. I think somewhere at the end of this track here. So it's also not just a hit, but also a roll. And the end is kind of stopped. The same library. I used the same library here. It's again Pandora. And next up would be the more, let's say, uh, movie-like percussions. Okay, first instrument here would be um, the Hans Zimmer percussions by Spitfire and I used the Taiko Ensemble. And actually I introduced also, uh, I'm using the Junk XL mixes. That's very important because I consider these uh, mixes to be really suitable for, you know, uh, video games, but also for movies. I mean, Junk XL did a, Tom did a really great job mixing these things. And, um, uh, I also introduced a little bit of the closed mics here. Let me play that solo to you here. <clears throat> so 
so there's actually not really a lot going on. I just used the that these taiko ensembles to create some, uh, let's say, accents for the track. And the next in line here would be the Heaviosity Ethnic Drum Ensemble. And it sounds like this. So this is kind of dry, but if you hear this in combination with the Taiko Ensemble, which is sort of wet and roomish, so you hear that the the percussion setup is kind of developing, you know, evolving. Um, also, I used um, Severus um, Ensemble drums here for this line. So I definitely should check because for this track I said a lot of EQ, but we get later to that. I just quickly wanted to show you that I took out a lot of the low frequencies here because I just wanted to use this on top for the um, ethnic drum ensembles, the Heaviosity stuff and the Hans Zimmer Taiko ensemble and it sounds like this together. So I like to use several libraries and to create kind of an arrangement for the drums too. So not just use one or two sample libraries, percussion sample libraries and just, you know, hit fast drums and that's it because your ear can also, you know, get weak or let's say there is ear fatigue going on. So the more you listen to very heavy instruments over a long period of time, um, the more, let's say, annoyed your ear will become. So I just tend to see this like an like a string ensemble. You put some contrabasses, um, double basses, and not really that often, just sparse to give, give, give you some accents and then build um, faster stuff with violas or even the violins. So in this example, I also use the audio frame ensemble, the, the epic frame library here. And this is really dry, um, but fast 16th notes. And all together, it sounds like this. Oh, let me just. So we get a nice little loop going. And in between all of this, I have some very, let's say, epic um, accents on the one and every four bars. And again, for this, I used Pandora, the cinematic drums. Let me just... So let me play these. It's also roll going in through the next section and together... Sorry, percussions only. Or oh, this part here. So one instrument left here. At the end I used, last but not least, um, Storm Choir Ultimate. It's definitely my to go to um, choir library. And I love this uh, program, this, this patch, Ultimate Performance, because you have these eight syllables and you just... And you can come up with some pretty cool stuff pretty quickly because you just need to load the library and just go playing and that's it. So I used the choirs like this in this track. So what I basically do is uh, kind of match the uh, trumpets, the French horns and the high strings here. And this part, let me just play you that part with a choir here. OK, 
Okay, so let's get into the mixing and mastering process. So let me pull up the mixer and see what we did here. Um, in general, you see all of these instruments. So let me just clean up that mixer by using my show data only. And now you can see all, let me just make this a little bit bigger. So we just see the instruments we really used during that track. So you can see that there are just two EQs going. And I showed that before when we talked about the Severus uh, drums. And I also did the same to the, the ADO frame ensemble. Let me pull that up for a second. So playing you the frames. Bypassed. And with EQ. So all I basically did was designing or EQing these instruments to give me um, specific instruments for the low frequencies, specific instruments for the, let's say, the mid frequencies and specific instruments for the high frequencies. So I can come up with a, you know, sense making uh, percussion arrangement. I hope that makes sense what I was trying to say. So when you listen to the full percussions again, there is kind of a clarity going on. You have defined low instruments playing very sparse, mid instruments playing not that often but just introduce some kind of a you know some kind of ornaments and high percussions which are there to deliver all that excitement and the speed of the track so back to the mixer here um there is more going on on the stems but not that much so we can uh, check out what's going on with the strings here so let me play that without anything So just some subtle compression and some, um, you know, air EQ on that. Just, intro just introducing that little bit of shimmer on top. Um, the same setup basically for the brass, but just compression. Besides that, I left everything as it is. So you can see nothing is going on. Um, and just to clarify, I said before that I used the RC48. This was just, you know, from when I was working on that track and decided during the live stream to turn these off and introduce the Seventh Heaven reverb later. So in this demo, in this video, um, there was at no point um, these instances active. So you heard these dry instruments. So I just left them in here because I forgot to delete them. <laughs> so next up would be um, the orchestral stem. We also, or the orchestra bus, we also talked about this. I just have this little... This little reverb instance going to make it a little bit more epic. And, um, you know, in general, a little bit bigger. For the percussions, there is EQ going on. So again, I took a lot uh, to, to try to balance it a little bit more. There's a little, a lot of boomish noise going on right now here. So just try to get rid of this. And the next thing is also after that in line, the same again percussions, uh, compression, and a little bit of air, and a little bit of air EQ on top. Okay, so next up would be the choirs. And there is some stuff going on here, so let me just play, um, let me just open these. Put them next to each other. And then go back to that part. Let me play this back for you. And basically get rid of all these plugins right now. So just to mention, I also put um, the reverb off of the, from the library, the additional reverb, and I raised the closed mics a little bit from the, from the choirs to make it a little bit more, you know, uh, present. Now I put this kind of EQ on top. And 
to make them a little bit more, you know, cutting through the track here around this 5k area and get rid of these 500 um, because for this track, uh, they are a little bit too dull. And then followed by compression, and I always put a lot of compression on choirs. Because in my opinion, it always helps to cut through the rest of these instruments and, um, you know, uh, reduce the dynamic a little bit so I can move them a little bit higher and they stay more, let's say, balanced throughout the entire track. And last but not least, we have the East Church preset here. Uh, let me just play this for you first. Bypassed. So it's almost drowning in reverb, but as I said before, the same I wanted to have for the orchestra, I want to have the same for the choir, because when you listen to Lord of the Rings soundtrack uh, in specific, you hear that there is a lot of reverb going on, especially on the choirs, and this kind of, you know, makes it familiar to the ear to, you know, get into that role-playing or adventurous feeling. <laughs> Okay, now let's check what's going on on the mastering section. So I got these, or I just tried to set them in line so you can see them all together. Uh, let's do it like this. So you can see that the first plugin happening on that mastering chain is the Dynamic Spectrum Mapper. I use version 2. Um, the next one would be OTT. Don't want to live without that plugin anymore. Next up would be a limiter. I use the AOM Invis Invisible Limiter. And last but not least, we have the Oxford Inflator on that track. So let me just play you um, the track from the beginning by bypassing all of these plugins here. Okay, so now let's um, turn on the Spectrum Mapper here. Next up, OTT. Now the limiter. And last in that chain would be the Oxford Inflator. So as you can hear, we don't get too crazy with the mastering. We just want to provide an overall, let's say, standard volume and by preserving all the dynamics because there is a lot more going on inside that game. There will be special effects, there will be voiceovers, and we also want to be aware of this. Okay, so I hope you enjoy this little walkthrough of creating our little in-game battle track for a potential video game. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. I would be also happy if you give this video a like or subscribe to my channel if you liked it, there will be more upcoming videos like this. I should also mention that if you're supporting me on Patreon, you will get access to these files, to the MIDI files, to the production stems for studying purposes, though you can make use of these tracks or listen to these tracks, the individual stems, to get a better idea of what's going on inside this video. For now, I'm saying thank you for your time. Thank you for watching this video and hope to see you next time. Bye.